Well, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, well, I'm uh, going to be speaking mainly today on Kabbalah. Yesterday, uh, I set up some of the history, and I didn't go fully in depth into the history of Hasidic Judaism, and so I'm going to uh, explain a little bit of that very, very briefly. First of all, I want to explain, um, yesterday we talked about the Baal Shem Tov, we talked about um, uh, Shabbatai Zvi, who rose to uh, great stature in the eyes of the Jews, uh, about two-thirds of the European Jewry believed that Shabbatai Zvi was in fact the Messiah. And uh, he obviously, and of course was not, and when he converted to Islam, that was a big blow to the Jewish communities. However, it wasn't as big a blow as some might think because uh, they believed that the Messiah would descend into the lower realms in to uh, bring up the sparks, which we will talk about today. Um, and so they thought that it was okay. A lot of the Jews believed that it was okay that Shabbatai Zvi actually converted to Islam. And uh, so uh, then you, of course, have the rise of the Baal Shem Tov. At the same time, you have uh, uh, Jacob Franck, who was uh, pr uh, prominent uh, around the same time as the Baal Shem Tov. Somebody asked me, uh, so I still don't understand how Hasidic Judaism came out of that. Well, that's a good question. So basically what happened is uh, the Baal Shem Tov, after he uh, was a Baal Shem, a, what I like to call a uh, witch doctor, essentially, uh, after he was a Baal Shem Tov, he kind of settled down, and that's when he really gained a following, and he gained seven main students. These seven students became the seven branches of, of the what the Hasids like to now refer to as the Eitz Chaim. I'm sure we're all familiar with the term the Eitz Chaim. We, uh, this is another perversion in my mind of, of uh, Satan taking something that's holy and perverting it, okay? We have the Eitz Chaim in, the, in, the, uh, in Genesis, right, in Genesis 2. Uh, there's the Eitz Chaim, and yeah, okay. Anyway, so they say that the Baal Shem Tov, uh, who was this leader figure, uh, he was the roots to the Eitz Chaim, and they have now perverted this into their own thing. And these seven leaders uh, became the seven main branches of Hasidic Judaism. One of the, and each one of these seven leaders was uh, a dynastic leader, okay. And so uh, it wasn't actually the Baal Shem Tov who came up with the idea of the Tzadik, something that we will talk about today. That was one of his students. One of his students, real, I mean, he, he was already kind of uh, moving that way. Um, there's a lot of history that's involved in this. And I, and I strongly suggest if this at all interests you to, to go and, and uh, research it. The information is readily available. You can find it in uh, the Encyclopedia Judaica. Uh, believe it or not, and I would never promote such a website, but Wikipedia actually has a lot to say about uh, the Baal Shem Tov and his students. Um, and a lot of it is actually factual. That does not mean that you should go and rest all of what you believe on the Wikipedia page on the Baal Shem Tov. Please do not hear me say that. I'm just saying that there's a lot of information out there about this, okay? So from these seven students of the Baal Shem Tov, uh, comes these seven different dynasties, and the seven di different dynasties are what become seven of the main factions of Hasidic Judaism. And this is what has now turned into, uh, for instance, the Chabad, which is the most prominent of the Hasidic uh, sects today. And why is the Hasidic uh, sect of Chabad so prominent? Why do we, when we, yesterday I said, uh, what, do you, what do we think of when we think of Orthodox Judaism? And, and the first two answers were black and white and peyot. Well, that's actually the Chabad. We think black and white, black and white is actually the Chabad. And uh, the reason they wear black and white is because that is the identity marker for them to let other people know that they, that they are Chabad. The reason the Chabad are so prevalent is because uh, the Schneerson dynasty, how many of you have heard of Rebbe Schneerson? Okay, Rebbe Schneerson, if you don't know who Rebbe Schneerson was, I don't like calling him Rebbe Schneerson, but neither here nor there. Rebbe Schneerson uh, died in, I believe, 96. It was prophesied that uh, from the first Schneerson Rebbe, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tov, it was prophesied that, I forget, I think he was the sixth, the sixth Rebbe would be the Messiah. Who was the sixth Rebbe? Rabbi Schneerson was the sixth Rebbe. And Rabbi Schneerson uh, didn't have, he was the seventh, I'm sorry, he was the seventh Rebbe. Uh, the, the seventh Rebbe, uh, he did not have any children. 
which means that he could not pass his dynasty of being the Rebbe on to the next generation. And so the Chabad said, aha, see, this proves it. His dynasty ends because he is, in fact, the Messiah. So when he died in 1996, this was a big blow to the, Chas, the, uh, the Chabad, but not really because then they just changed their theology. And they said, well, it's okay that he's dead because he is still the Messiah. He's just going to raise from the dead first, and he will then redeem his people. Okay, I have not found this myself, but I have heard rumors that it, that it has been stated by the Chabad that Rebbe Schneerson is who he is. Do you know what that is a reference to? I am who I am. Who said that? yod heh vav -Hey. So uh, if that claim is true, which I have not been able to substantiate, but if that claim is true, then the Chabad are actually claiming Schneerson to be God incarnate. Okay? And that actually, as we're going to see, is not so far of a shift at all. In fact, it's right on line with Chabad teaching. But the Schneerson dynasty uh, is very famous for trying to evangelize people back to Judaism. That's why we know so much about the Chabad, because they put Chabad houses in every major city. They go out and they try to find the Jews. They've been to my father's house to try to bring him back to the Chabad belief. Okay, So that's how uh, the Hasidic movement basically got started with this one guy and his seven students. Now we have over 50 major dominant uh, sects of Chabad, or of uh, Hasidic, rather, I'm sorry, not Chabad, but of Hasidic. They all uh, are identified in different ways, okay? They don't all wear black and white. That's just the, the Chabad. In fact, the, uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, the Bobovers, they wear something else. There's some guys who wear knee-high uh, black shorts, and then they wear these tight leggings, uh, so they kind of look like pilgrims. You have other guys who wear all white. Some guys wear all gray. Some guys wear, you know, all, different sects wear different things. And they do that all to so that other Hasids can see them and say, oh, you're wearing this, you're a bob over. Oh, you're wearing this, you're a uh, breast lover, okay? The next thing that we need to talk about is what is Kabbalah. Somebody asked the other day, I keep using this word Kabbalah, what is it? Well, Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Ka I mean, you can say it different ways, like it really got famous in the late 1990s to 2000s when a famous singer named Madonna started wearing a red string around her wrist and said that she was a Kabbalist. Madonna is not a Kabbalist. Uh, she thinks she's a Kabbalist. She's not. Um, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, so what are we talking about when we use the word Kabbalah or Kabbalah? That's a very good question, and it's not an easy answer. What I'm going to be talking about today is the theology of Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah? Okay. Just as a very brief overview, the, the Kabbalah is actually a collection of mystical Jewish writings. So when somebody says, I read the Kabbalah or I read the Kabbalah, that's not a valid statement. Because the main source of the Kabbalah, or the Kabbalah, is the Zohar. So you could say, I'm reading the Zohar, which is a book within Kabbalistic theology. But really what Kabbalah is, is just that, a, a mystical Jewish theology. I'm going to argue that it's not actually Jewish. Okay? That's what this paper is going to be about, and that's what this, uh, th that's why we're going to talk about theology. So with that being said, let me just quickly sum up. Well, yesterday we talked about where uh, mysticism had come by the 13th century. The expulsion of the Jews uh, from Spain in 1492 was a big factor in all this. The rise of Shabbatai Zavi in uh, European Jewry, and then obviously into the 17th, 17th, 18th century we have the birth and the rise of uh, of the Baal Shem Tov. The Shem Tovs were actually miracle workers, as they like to call themselves. I would call them witch doctors. They were witch doctors. I believe that there was uh, all sorts of things that went on with the Baal Shems, such as demon possession. I think that there was uh, a lot of demonic force that happened with the Baal Shems. And I am convinced that uh, Israel ben Eliezer, who is now known as the Baal Shem Tov, was very much involved in uh, demonic activity. And a lot of people are going to say that uh, I'm, I'm uh, anti-Semitic for that. However, I would remind any person uh, who would like to say that to please go read Maimonides 
and things that he has to say about people who use amulets or cast spells. If you are Jewish and you don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, okay, we can talk about that too. But the point is, is that if you're going to take Maimonides as a hailed great rabbi, then you would have to then push out the Baal Shem Tov as a false teacher and someone who should not be listened to. So now let's talk about the actual belief and the structure of theology that comes with Kabbalah. And when we say Kabbalah, now uh, the, there's many different theologies and beliefs that make up Hasidic Judaism. All these different, you know, over 50 factions of Hasidic Ju Judaism. So this person over here who's a Satmar, Hasid, he believes that Israel should not be a nation. He's going to burn the Israeli flag. He's going to stomp on it. He's going to align himself with the Palestinians and say that he wants the Palestinian occupation to happen until uh, until the Messiah comes. The Chabad over here is going to say, no, we as Israel need to rise up. Okay, so there's all, even politically there's all these different beliefs, and that goes into their theology as well. The one unifying factor, well, there's more than one. I shouldn't say that. But for the most part, the major unifying factor within the Hasidic movement is the Kabbalah. And to be more specific, something called Lurianic Kabbalah. We talked about a little bit about the difference between that. This is all going to run together. Okay, what I'm what I'm going to present to you is the foundation of Kabbalah and Hasidic Kabbalah. You're not going to always know the difference when I'm talking about Hasidic Kabbalah as opposed to regular Kabbalah. It doesn't really matter because all of the Hasids believe in all of the Kabbalah which I'm going to present to you today. Okay, So let's start with the Ein Sof. Buckle your seat belts because this gets weird. Kabbalah begins by focusing on God's infinite attributes. These are, by the way, if you're uh, following along, I'm on page 9. There is a uh, QR code back there. You can scan it with your phone or your uh, tablet, and the paper will come up. Okay. These are the aspects of God that cannot be comprehended by the human mind. For example, God is eternal not only in time, but also in human attributes, which we attempt to attach to, to him. So the, the Kabbalists would say, well, God doesn't really have human attributes. Well, he does, really. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, we're going to attach human attributes to God. That's, and in every way, he's infinite in all those. Okay? Thus, such attributes inevitably fall short when we're talking about God. God is not just love. God is the infinite form of love, and therefore our human understanding of love cannot comprehend what is meant when it is said, God is love. We can't, as humans, can't even understand what that means. Because he's infinite in love, so we can't, we can't grasp it. And I understand that that's a New Testament reference. Apostolic God is love. Okay, I get it, but I'm trying to work with my audience here. Uh, thus, the term in sof, which literally means without end, quote, refers to that aspect of God that cannot be comprehended by us humans and which lies beyond anything we can imagine. This aspect of God has no attributes, that is to say that nothing can be said about it. No name can be given to this aspect of God. The divinity in his highest aspect is Ein Sof. Simply cannot be named. So when you hear uh, the term Ein Sof, we're talking about the infinite aspect of God. Infinity, which we cannot grasp. In, uh, if you have the paper, I have given you a chart here. This is actually a Kabbalistic rendering of the seven sefirot, which we're going to talk about here in a few moments, okay? But uh, you can look at that all you want. It is believed that from the Ein Sof, ten sefirot emanate and, quote, display ten different aspects, qualities, or attributes of God, end quote. So the, when I'm, I'm painting very broad strokes for you here. The Ein Sof is the infinite uh, nature of God, and then the sefirot are these ten emanations from God. And now we're going to get into these. These ten emanations make up what can be termed the Godhead. Which it, what is interesting about these Godhead ash, attributes is that some are actually lower than others in the Kabbalistic thinking of things. Okay, So the lowest attribute is, the lo, is literally the lowest of the attributes. The highest is the highest of the attributes. So when someone says to me, you believe in the Trinity? 
yes, I do believe in the Trinity. That is, and I know that a lot of Messianics are going to push against that. Okay, fine, we can talk about that. I believe in the Trinity. Uh, I, you know, I'm Trinity positive. Okay, and um, when when a Hasid or uh, yeah, when a Hasid says to me, "Oh well, you know, you're a pagan, you, you're an idolater because you w- believe in the Trinity," oh yeah, you believe in the seven, uh, in the ten Sefirot from the Ein Sof. And not only that, but I say that all three of the of of the Godhead are equal. You say that the ten Sefirot are not equal. Something's wrong with that. Okay. Emanating from the end self, each sephirot becomes lower and lower until the tenth sephirot, which is the closest to the human realm that we live in. The first and highest of the sephirot is Keter, sometimes called Ayin, or nothingness. We're going to talk about that below. And is considered the closest to the Ein Sof. Chokmah, the second of the sephirot, is the divine will to create and our entire visible reality comes from Chokmah. Through this sephirah, a human can now uh, can know the divine will. Quote, the third sephirah is Bina. In the sephirah, the still undifferent, I'm sorry, in the third, in this sephirah, the still undifferentiated model of creation contained in Chokmah is distinguished in all its components. Here, all things gain a more or less distinctive identity. The Kabbalists saw Chokmah as an active masculine power by contrast with the, which Bina stood as a passive feminine power within the deity. Thus, they created two powers which were opposed to each other, a principle which comes to uh, a foray also in the Sephirah, which still remained to emanate. I'm going to read uh, my uh, footnote here. It should be noted that there is an entire aspect of Hasidic Kabbalah that brings a sexual nature to this theology. While I did not want to dive into, a, uh, perverted, into the perverted nature of this theology, because there are children in this room. Uh, It should be understood that the Hasidic belief states that before the breaking of the vessels, which we will talk about below, the male and female aspects of the Ein Sof were interlocked in a sexual position. Once the vessels broke, the sexual union was broken, and the male and female parts of the Ein Sof were turned away from each other. Louis Jacobs also talks about uh, a debate that raged about motion within prayer, and this comes from davening, okay? Um, some Hasidic rabbis believe that prayer actually was a form of copulation with the Ruach. It is extremely, extremely demonic, in my personal opinion. The lowest of the Sephirah is Malchut. The belief within Kabbalah, Kabbalism is that this emanation is the Shekinah. So now we have the Spirit of God as the lowest. <clears throat> they don't even try to say that it's on par with God. It is the lowest, since it is the emanation that connects to our physical world. Quote, the three higher sephirah, uh, sephirot have to do with the divine thought, the seven lower with the divine emanation, uh, emotions, as it were, as man- manifesting that thought. Malchut, or the Shekinah, is the link between the sephirotic realm and the worlds beneath. Luriana Kabbalah asked a new question. Okay, so you have Kabbalah. Now, Luriana Kabbalah comes along and it asks this question. How did God create the world? Luriana Kabbalah answered this with the concept of Zimzum. Since the Ein Sof, I know this is getting very technical. It's going to get even more technical. Since the Ein Sof is eternal, this leaves no room for creation. In other words, if the Ein Sof were to create something and this object took up space, this would limit the Ein Sof since the Ein Sof would no longer be taking up that space. In order to create, the Ein Sof took part in Zimzum, and that is the act of contraction. God withdrew or contracted him into himself, thus leaving room for creation. I, I, I think everyone has gotten that, but I'll, I'll explain it this way. If God is and nothing else is, and he's infinite in, in his nature, and then he creates me, I now have taken up space. That means that God is no longer taking up that space, which means God is no longer infinite in space. So that, thus, to the Kabbalist, that can't happen because that limits God. And so they create this theology of zimzum, the, the retraction. Let's talk about the shattering of the vessels and the sparks. Remember we talked about how Shabbatai Zavi, his believers thought that he could go into the lower realms to redeem the fallen sparks. Okay, let's talk about that. One of the major jumping points within Luriana Kabbalah is the shattering of the vessels. Quote, Adam uh, and Adam 
Uh, Kadmon in the Hebrew is nothing but a first configuration of the divine light which flows from the essence of Ein Sof into the primeval uh, space primeval space of the Zimzum, not indeed from all its sides, but like a beam in one direction only. He, therefore, is the first and highest form in which the divinity begins to manifest itself after the Zimzum from his eyes, mouth, and ears, and nose. The lights of the Sephirot burst forth. At first, these lights were coalesced in a totally, uh, in totality without any differentiation between the various Sephirot. In this state, they did not require bowls or vessels to, to hold them. Okay, so I don't know if you've caught this, but basically this quote is talking about the light that has burst forth from the Ain Self. Okay, so when God decides he's going to create, what does he do? He bursts forth light. Okay, since, however, the divine scheme of things involved the creation of, uh, of finite beings and forms, each with its own allotted place in the ideal hi hierarchy, it was necessary that these isolated lights should be caught and preserved in special bowls or vessels created uh, or rather emanated for this particular purpose. The vessels, which corresponded to the three highest sephirot, accordingly, gave shelter to their light. But when the, what, when the turn of the lower six came, the light broke forth at, the, at once, and its impact proved too much for the vessels, which were broken and shattered. The same, though not to quite the same extent, also occurred with the vessel of the last sephirot. So basically what they're saying is God decided to create. Zim Zoom, he, uh, he, he retracts into himself to create room for us, basically, or for whatever. Then he shoots out this light, but the light is too uh, magnificent, so he makes these vessels. Uh, the three higher sephirot, are, their vessels are contained, and this is how you have God. And then the lower vessels, they shattered, and that was a problem. According to Luriana Kabla, as the pieces of the vessels uh, of the broken vessels fell, they trapped and retained some of the divine light. Some of these shards, also referred to as sparks, fell through the cosmic void into Sitra Akra, the other side, and became shrouded in darkness. darkness. This is how you have sin within Kabbalah. The darkness is the sin. Our world is made up of these sparks, according to this belief, our world is, quote, the, the worst of all possible worlds in which there is still hope. <clears throat> Pardon me. The, the, the theology of Zimzum was a new take on Kabbalistic teaching by Luria. This doctrine is important for our study as it is one of the foundational doctrines of the Hasidim. Zimzum is not only the Kabbalistic theology in which God created the worlds, it is also how evil was created. Luria brought a provocative new spin on the Ein Sof. While traditional Kabbalah taught that the Ein Sof, made up of the Sephirot, existed in perfect harmony, Luria taught that the powers of Din uh, were able to exist disharmoniously. This disharmonious power, and Din is one of the uh, Sephir, uh, Sephirot, this disharmonious power within uh, Ein Sof was capable of turning from disharmony to evil. So now, basically what you've done, and I think that this is a, a, a sure sign of idolatry is that you have, have basically made God into evil. God is responsible for evil. God is those pieces of evil. Okay? The withdrawal of the deity, uh, I'm sorry, quote, uh, the withdrawal of the deity has been called one of the most revolutionary ideas in the history of Kabbalah. Although Luria's origin, uh, originality in this regard cannot be disputed, he was still inspired by ideas that had been developed earlier. Already in a tractate of the Iyun circle from uh, early Kabbalah, where you read that in the creation of the world, God withdraws into himself, like someone holding his breath, after which a darkness arises in which the emanation process takes place. Isaac Luria adopted the idea and elaborated it into the theory of Zimzum as a fu fundamental principle of his teaching. I know this is super weird, and you might be thinking to yourself, why is this guy up here talking about this? We don't care about this get to the Bible. Why I'm talking about this is because Judaism as a whole has been affected. You might not realize this, but even your reform synagogue down the road that is not into Hasidic Judaism has been greatly affected by this theology right here. The, the Orthodox, they have been affected by this theology, but the Hasids, they not only have been affected by it, they grab onto this and they believe it. They practice this. Let's talk about nothingness. 
I couldn't when I when I was studying this and I first came to nothingness. I, I thought to myself, this is Buddhism. Um, it's not though. It's a little they they put a spin on it. Within Kabbalah and Hasidic Judaism, there is a specific teaching that is somewhat hard to grasp. It is the concept of ayin or nothingness. The Kabbalistic philosophy of nothingness comes from uh, comes from Jewish and pagan philosophers. This philosophy turned theology states that God created out of nothing. Nothingness in this respect is not devoid of thing, but rather is aspects of God that are unattainable to the human mind. Much like the concept of Ein Sof, Ayin is the aspects of God that a human mind cannot grasp. Okay, so you're going to say, what's the difference between Ein Sof and Ayin? Well, Ein Sof is the infinite, infinity, the infinite aspect of God. Ayin is the other aspects of God that are beyond our comprehension. It's not the infinity part of it, it's the other aspects that we can't grasp. Ayin is, the, is in fact one of the ten sefirot, it's Keter, and is therefore an emanation of the end self. In an article by Daniel Matt, he writes, quote, The word nothingness, of course, connotes negativity and non-being, but what the mystic means by divine nothingness is that God is greater than anything, one thing one can uh, can imagine no thing, so it's not nothing; it's no thing. Since God's being is uh, incomprehensible and ineffable, the least offensive and most accurate description one can offer is paradoxically nothing. Are you with me? <laughs> uh, thus, nothingness is the emanation of the end self that are beyond comprehension. Literally, nothing can be said about them because they are beyond the scope of human comprehension. This is all going to tie together, too. So let's talk about pan, panentheism and Betul Hayesh. From the understanding of Ein Sof, the Kabbalist believes that there are truly only two things in the universe, the Ein Sof and Ayin, which, of course, is part of God, right? They're both God. This world was a reflection of the Ein Sof before the fall of man, at which time the Ein Sof was put at odds with itself. Now that the vessels have broken, we are still a reflection of the Ein, Ein Sof, but we have had the other side penetrate, thus bringing in darkness. This theology seeks uh, uh, reeks of Eastern religion. Hinduism, as an example, is pantheistic, believes that God is in everything. How Has, uh, Hasidism uh, twists this around. God is not in everything. Rather, everything is in God. Quote, the particular doctrine of the Baal Shem Tov and his followers has sometimes been called pantheistic. This is a misnomer. No attempt was ever made by the Hasidim to identify the universe with God. The more correct description of the doctrine is panentheism, the belief that all is in God. Such ideas were certainly not the invention of the Baal Shem Tov, nor except in the Chabad group. And actually, this is a reference to the Tanya, a, uh, a systematic writing of Kabbalistic mysticism, according to the Lubavitch Chabad. If you don't know what the Tanya is, it's also as nuts as uh, the Zohar. <coughs> Basically, the Chabad... Uh, took all this theology and they put it into a systematic theology. So if you want to read the, read about it, go read the Tanya. It's very. I opened up the Tanya and I spent about ten minutes and I was like, dude, my head hurts. Uh, where they where they developed uh, where they developed uh, by the Hasidim in the systematic way. But he and his followers, that is the uh, Baal Shem Tov and his followers, gave them fresh emphasis and applied them in their daily life. Since all things are in God and there is no place empty of Him. The Baal Shem Tov taught that rather than practice asceticism in order to find God, man should use the things of the world to bring him nearer to God. Hasidism teaches that the worship of God is to be realized in the concrete forms of the here and now. The Hasidic is not normally in favor of asceticism, though some of the Hasidic masters were ascetics, nor is he a hermit. But the things of the world are, for Hasidism, only the means by which he can grasp divinity. The true aim of the Hasid is to penetrate beneath appearances, to see only the divine vitality which infuses all things. His ultimate aim is to attainment of what Hasidism calls betul hayesh, annihilation of the self. The ego is left behind as man's soul soars aloft through his contemplation of the tremendous themes that, God, that all is in God. The neoplatonic element in Hasidic thought 
which came to Hasidism through the Kabbalah, and the striking resemblances to far eastern views on the illusory nature of the world of the essence cannot be overestimated. End quote. Plato's famous philosophy of idealism, that what we perceive in our world has no real substance but is in reality the prime ideal, uh, the prime ideal projected upon the world by the de de demurge. Am I saying that right? Demiurge, I apologize. Uh, Plato's famous cave illustration offered a vision explanation. There were people chained to a cave floor and able to, only to look at the cave wall. Above on a ledge was a fire and a person casting shadows from, that, from the light of the fire onto the cave wall. Those chained to the floor were unable to see the fire or the person and could only see the sh shadows on the wall. Plato taught that we are, in fact, those people chained to the floor. This world was nothing more than a shadow on the wall. When we see a table, it is not really a table. It is just a shadow of what a table really is. That is, like an emanation of the ideal, which is the reality. We, uh, if you've ever heard, seen The Matrix, that is much like what Plato was kind of thinking of. Okay? Hasidism does the same thing with the Ein Sof. We might look at our arm or our leg and say, this is my arm or this is my leg. This, however, is not the case. Everything is simply a reflection of the Ain Self, and therefore a reflection of God, and therefore everything is God. Quote, the difference between the philosophical and Kabbalistic vision is thus a question of the point of departure. The philosopher takes the arm as a human concept. Arm is something human, something that really exists in our human world. When we then use this human term for God, this is only a metaphor in the divine world since God does not have human arms in real life. For the Kabbalist, all this is precisely the other way around. He takes the arm as the, a divine concept and a, an aspect within the divine, which really exists there. If we, uh, if we use this divine term for humans, this is merely a metaphor, or better, a symbol, in the human world itself, since with all their physical limitations, humans do not really have this divine arm, end quote. With the belief that everything is made of the Ensof, or Ayan, which is also another name for an emanation of the Ensof, the Hasid attempts to practice Devakut, i.e. becoming attached to God. It is believed that through prayer, the Hasid can engage Devakut, using it as a ladder, or to climb the rungs of the Sefirot. Such prayer that will take a person on the journey of Devakut is not average, but rather takes much preparation, including the moving of one's bowels before prayer begins, an hour of preparation, and deep concentration on nothingness. And this, this is how they put themselves into trance states. If a Hasid is able to concentrate on nothingness enough, placing himself in what could be described as a trance state, he can attain to Batul Hayesh, a level of being where the ego and self is left behind. Quote, the Hasid is expected to attain to the state described in Hasidic thought as Batul, Batul Hayesh, the annihilation of somethingness, that is, an awareness that God alone is truly reality and that all finite things are, as it were, dissolved in his unity. Batul Hayesh includes the annihilation of selfhood, the soul soaring to God with the ego left behind. This attitude is especially to be cultivated at the time of prayer, so that in Hasidism, prayer is essentially an exercise in world forsaking and abandonment of self. <clears throat> okay, so now let's move to tikkun olam. Uh, I've heard many messianics use the term tikkun olam. I want to first tell you that I think as messianics, that term should probably be struck for, from our vocabulary. And the reason why is because when we are talking to other Jews or when we're talking to Orthodox Jews or Hasidic Jews who are aware of what the theology of Tikkun Olam is, everything that I'm talking about right now, this is what they think we're talking about. Now that might not be what you're talking about, but that certainly is what they think you're talking about. <laughs> There is different contexts, but I, I still would like to uh, present the idea that uh, tikkun olam is, is wrapped up in this theology when you're talking to a Jewish person. 
As the pieces of the Hasidic and Kabbalistic puzzle come together, we are now able to better understand the concept of tikkun olam, or repairing the world. There is no doubt that as believers in the Messiah Yeshua, we are charged to make the world a better place, to help repair this world of the darkness uh, sin has brought by spreading the light of the Messiah Yeshua. But when the Hebrew term tikkun olam is used, this is not what it is meant. According to the Hasid, this world is made up of broken pieces of the vessels. These vessels were originally pieces of the Ein Sof. When the vessels broke, the Ein Sof's emanations were turned against each other. Thus, evil, according to the Hasid, is actually manifestations of the Shekinah. Quote, as Dov Be'er, the Magid preacher of Mezrich, the best successor as leader of the rapidly expanding Hasidic flock, explained it, since the evil once resided in the Godhead itself, it must have been good at its origin. If we can return it to the source, it will not only be cleansed of its evilness, but its force will be added to the goodness of the divine. End quote. It is the Hasidic understanding that when the vessels were shattered, most of the light of the Ein Sof went back to its original source, but some became attached to the broken shards of the vessels. These broken light shards are the source of evil. Adam was created to restore the divine shards back to their original source. He, that is Adam, was intended to do so through mystical exercises. However, Adam's sin got in the way, and he was unable to complete this task. Quote, as a result, good and evil remained thoroughly mixed in the created world, and human souls previously contained within Adam's also became imprisoned with the shards. The repair that is needed, therefore, is twofold. The gathering of light and of souls, and of souls to be achieved by human beings through the contemplative performance of religious acts. End quote. Since each person is a reflection of the Ein Sof, we are able to help repair the broken vessels. From this understanding, each person is responsible to help repair the broken Shekinah back to the unbroken sta uh, status. In so doing, we are taking evil out of the world while at the same time repairing God himself. Without the help of the righteous, the forces of good would not be able to prevail within the seven heavens, and the Ein Sof would not be able to be repaired. When the Hasid succeed in uh, enough to Kun Olam and the world has become pure enough, it will trigger the coming of the Messiah. Thus, to Kun Olam is not only helping the ain't self, but it is the tool to bring the Messiah. So let's move now to Hasidic prayer. Prayer is an intricate part of the Hasidic theology. Not only is the Hasid responsible for tikkun olam, but the cosmic process that brings blessing to mankind is affected through the acts and deeds of the righteous. Quote, since in the Kabbalah, it is man who can affect the cosmic processes by his deeds and thoughts, it follows that if man has these divine names and their combinations in mind, when he prays, he performs the tremendous task of sending upwards those impulses which help to promote greater harmony in the Sephirotic realm, and by so doing, he succeeds in bringing down the resulting flow of divine grace and blessing. This is controlling God and in my mind, is idolatry. The Hasidic took this responsible very seriously. So seriously that the Mitna Gadim believed that the Hasids were promoting breaking Torah. Since prayer was so important, the Hasidic practice was to, uh, was to prepare for prayer over long periods of time. As stated above, one was to discharge the bowels before prayer, one could not wear wool, one was to be fully concentrated on the task at hand, and nothing should interfere. According to Hasidic theology, if one was able to attain a high level of kavana, that is concentration, during prayer, he could attain debakut attachment to God, and thus would be in the literal presence of God. The Hasid would go to unbelievable lengths to reach such state, such a state in prayer, and thus the Mitnagadim realized that the set times for prayers were being broken by the Hasids. To the Mitnagadim, this was a direct violation of oral Torah, and therefore a violation of Torah itself. To the Hasid, reaching a level of Dabakut in prayer super, super, uh, surpassed the commands. It was also believed that when a person transcended uh, this world through prayer and was taken to one of the other worlds, he was taken out of time. Thus, prayer times didn't matter. Right? If you're not in time anymore, then prayer times don't matter. <clears throat> prayer was no longer a conversa uh, conversation between God and man. It was no longer the unrighteous man approaching the holy God. Rather, it was each man's duty to help the Shekinah. Without this prayer and devotion, much would be lost, and this world, not to mention the Ein Sof itself, would fall deeper into darkness. Prayer had now become the duty of every Jew for the sake of God and the world. 
Due to the practice and belief of the Baal Shems, the Kabbalists wanted to change the traditional prayer book so that the one praying would be able to properly arrange the names of God during prayer so as to have them properly in mind. Get what's going on? If we can control God by saying these words the right way and saying his name the right way, then we should try to do that in our prayer book because then we'll really control him every time we pray, right? They did this, this by altering the Sephardi prayer book. This was beyond offensive to the Mitnagadim and brought even more spite between the groups. The Mitnagadim argued that the prayers within the prayer book were handed down in words as well as arrangement from Sinai. To counter, the Hasids put forth the belief that every tribe was given its own gateway in which to enter a higher, the higher worlds. That gateway was their, prayer, their own prayer book. Okay? Since no one knew which tribe they were from, the Lurianic prayer book was seen as the 13th prayer book one in which anyone from any tribe would use as a gateway. This did two things for the Hasid. Number one, it gave them an answer to the question that if the prayers were handed down from Sinai, why do we have different versions? And number two, it gave them the ability to use their own Lurianic Kabbalah. Kabbalah I'm sorry, their own Lurianic prayer book. <clears throat> so in other words, uh, you have this gateway that God gave you. It's a prayer book. Each tribe has their own prayer book. So there's 12 prayer books. But... He knew that all the tribes were going to be dispersed, so let's make a thirteenth. So he made a thirteenth prayer book. That's what we have. That's what we made. It's quite clever, actually. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about reincarnation. Okay, this blows my mind. Some might be surprised to find out that reincarnation is a central part of Hasidism. It is not specific to Hasidism, but is found in the Zohar and is a belief of Kabbalistic. Uh, Kabbalists in general. Chabad.org explains this clearly. Quote, consequently, many Jews are surprised to learn or may even wish to deny that reincarnation, the revolving of souls through a succession of lives or uh, Gilgulim, is an inter inter integral part of Jewish belief. But this teaching has always been around, and it is firmly rooted in source verses. The Holy Ari explained it most simply, every Jew must fulfill all 613 mitzvot, and if he does, doesn't succeed in one lifetime, he comes back again and again until he finishes. While this might seem like an odd shift for Judaism, it is actually quite logical and brilliant on their behalf. A belief in reincarnation does two things for the Kabbalists. Number one, it takes away the need for a suffering Messiah and makes the messianic expectation only apply to the nation of Israel as a whole. Right? I don't need to be saved. I can come back and do it again. I don't need Yeshua to come and save me. So this is an attack on the Messiah himself. This is convenient when debating Christians, as those with faith in the Messiah believe he took away the, the sin of his elect. If the reincarnation, if reincarnation is believed, it takes the need for pray, uh, payment of sin away. At least in their minds, it does. It doesn't actually, because God still requires payment for sin. The second thing it does is reincarnation solidifies the shift that began in the Talmudic era away from the sovereignty of God and moves Jewish theology completely in a free will direction. I understand that the room that I am talking to is predominantly uh, holds to a free will model. So I'm not trying to down anyone's personal belief, okay? Um, however, I, think I, am, I do not hold to a free will doctrine. I hold to a sovereignty doctrine, okay? Sovereignty of God within salvation. No longer is, God, is it God who chooses Israel or God who directs a Jew's life, but rather it is the Jew who seeks after God and directs his own life in a random ordered system. Okay, and I'll read the footnote on this. I have not been able to find evidence of a free will model in rabbinic literature before the story of the Torah being offered to all the nations, in which only Israel responded positively to accept the Torah. However, I am willing to see evidence of an early shift in such a theology. Interestingly, the debate over predestination within the church came to blows in the 5th century between Pelagius and Augustus, Augustine. Rather. Since at this time the Talmud was still being edited and redacted, one cannot help but wonder if the Talmudic rabbis were being drawn into a similar discussion by the ongoing theological debates among the Christian authorities. Reincarnation had made its way into the everyday life of Jewish practice, particularly within Israel. Kosher slaughter is extremely stringent in Israel. Okay, it's much more stringent than here. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Uh, so, like, uh, the Union Orthodox here, they, like, in Israel, that's, like, the lowest. 
the lowest form of kosher is Union Orthodox. Everything is much more stringent than that, much more so than in the U.S. One of the reasons this has taken place is that kosher slaughter of animals has become much more than what a person can or cannot eat. The slaughter itself has become a ritual, and if this ritual is not performed correctly, it can directly affect souls. Quote, a dimension of magic whose spread, whose spread was aided by the Kabbalah was the concept of reincarnation of the soul, the belief that the souls of the deceased return to this world in different forms, as a human being, an animal, or an in inanimate object. Kosher slaughter and eating the, in accordance with Jewish law, incorporating washing of hands and uh, res resuscitation of uh, blessings, res res I'm sorry, I said that wrong, uh, acquired an additional magical aura uh, because of the notion of reincarnation. Thus, if an animal were slaughtered according to the laws of Kashrut, then the soul that had been reincarnated in that beast was set free and able to improve its spiritual level. While the scope of this study is not kosher food and its slaughter, this does raise the question, if we as believers are not to eat food that has been used within pa pagan ritual, should we be eating kosher food that has been slaughtered according to Hasidic halakha as it is believed to release reincarnated souls and bring them back as humans? If this is truly a ritual that is done during the slaughter process, should we as believers support and eat such food? Uh, now, I, I understand this brings up a huge uh, debate that we could have. But basically my point is this. I don't think that, look, when I... Uh, when I walk into P.F. Chang's and they got a huge Buddha sitting there, I don't have a problem sitting down and eating food. A lot of believers do. A lot of believers are going to say to me, you can't walk into P.F. Chang's and sit down because they got a huge Buddha right in the, in the front. I think Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 8. But however, a lot of believers take a different view on that. Okay, that's fine. If you're going to take a different view on it and you're not going to participate in any food that has been uh, ritually slaughtered in pagan, uh, pagan ritual, then we have to ask the question, are you then allowed to eat Hasidically koshered food? As they, I mean, even the knife has to be a certain sharpness. If it's not a certain sharpness, it's not kosher enough. Why? Because the soul is not released to come back. So then the question becomes, are you willing to eat kosher food that's Hasidically koshered if you're not willing to eat uh, things that have to do with pagan ritual? That's, that's my question. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about the Zadik. Perhaps a cent the central aspect of Hasidism is the uh, theology of the Zadik. Each Hasidic movement has its own Zadik re or, or Rebbe. There's exceptions. I think there's five exceptions on that. Uh, the the Breslavers are one of those exceptions. I'll use them because I know them the best. They believe that when uh, Rabbi Nachman died, he was, uh, I think, a student of the, was he a direct student of the Baal Shem Tov? Great grandson, thank you. When the Baal Shem, or when the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, the uh, Rabbi Nachman, died, uh, they believed that he was kind of like, the, and they still use his writings. They basically look to him as their Rebbe. It's anyway, okay. Uh, so each Rebbe is, but for the most part, you get what I'm saying. Each Rebbe is believed to have uh, reached a level of perfection and is able to enter the very throne room of God. Such a tzaddik is responsible for the people under his charge. He is the intermediary between God and the people. He is responsible for the well-being of his followers along with providing them with children. He does that through prayer. This is done through prayer and in, in uh, intercession with the Almighty. In his book, Major Trends in, in Jewish Mysticism, Gershom Sholem gives strong evidence that the theology and writings of the Shabbatians Shabbat were in, in, integrated into the Hasidic theology. Shabbatai Zavi clearly had a semi-divine status among his followers, and it is not surprising to see such theology transfer, even if it took some time, over to the Hasidic movement. This is a long quote, but we're going to go with it. Quote, Rabbi Dov Be'er did not add anything of his own to Hasidic theory. He merely repeated the teachings of his masters. Only in one aspect did he make a contribution. He expanded, he expanded vastly the position of the Zadik, basing his claim upon the verse that Zadik, or the righteous man, is the foundation of the world, Proverbs 10.25. He ascribed to him dominion over the spiritual and material realm. Uh, world. The, the tzaddik is not only sim, uh, symbolic of the ideal li life, but is also invested with the power of extracting the will and favor of God. As the, seeds draw, as the seed draws its sustenance from the earth, so does the tzaddik derive his spiritual authority from the heavenly throne. The tzaddik is the pillar between heaven and earth, through which all the profusion from the upper world descend to this world. By his intercession with God, he can secure forgiveness for sins. 
The divine sparks inherent in the matter reveal in, to him their uh, secrets, and by his touch, of pro, uh, uh, his touch, profane things become sanctified. Where do we hear that from? Right? The, the woman with the flow of blood grabs onto Yeshua, and what happens? She becomes clean. He has the power of, of, uh, to confer with, uh, or withhold material blessings. The Hasid should therefore cling to the Zadik as a child cleaves to its mother. The theory of, of uh, Zadikism was still further enlarged by one of the Magid's disciples, Rabbi Elimelech of Liz, Lizensk, deceased in 1786. Rabbi Elimelech claimed that the Zadik is a peer to the angels, and through uh, the touch of his hands, the bitter becomes sweet. The Zadik knows how to combine the letters and words of the prayers in such a way as to reflect through them God's will. Through the powers of his prayer, he can therefore cure the sick and also prolong a man's life, even if it were God's will that he should die. To the Zadik was granted the secret knowledge of investing worldly occurrences with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, worldly occurrences with the holiness of the ineffable name, which constitutes their inner essence. Thus, when a Hasid asks the Zadik for a cure or for a livelihood, his request will be fulfilled because the Zadik has caused the name of God to penetrate into these things. The word of the Zadik is obeyed by God. The Zadik decrees God. The Zadik decrees, and God puts the decree into effect. In every generation, God obeys the Zadik, and the and the servant listens to as the servant listens to his master. The Zadikim are the holy ones to whom God commanded the children of Israel to bring their offerings. Did you get that? <laughs> so basically, the, the Hasidic belief is that when the children of Israel brought their offerings to the temple and sacrificed them, they were really bring those to offer to the Tzadik. The theology of the Zadik is a, is a man-made perversion of our Messiah Yeshua. It shows the longing the Jewish people have to be engaged in a personal relationship with God, the kind of relationship Christians have been teaching since our Master was on earth with us. My conclusion. In the Messianic movement today, we see people coming out of the Christian church who feel like they have been lied to, but they have also found something new and exciting. We see this all the time a life rooted in ancient belief and practice. Many people glamorize Jewish belief and without knowing the full story, attempt to emulate what they believe is Orthodox Judaism. Much of the time, people begin to emulate various Hasidic movements, perhaps known more than the Chabad. About a year ago, someone on Twitter was discussing with me. He was bringing up Rabbi Nachman, and I made the comment that I believe much of Hasidic theology was demonic. He wanted to know, what I meant by that, here is my answer to that specific tweet. Hasidism grew out of mysticism. Magic and dark arts were a central part of Jewish mysticism. The person responsible for bringing these theologies to the masses was himself a performer of things the Torah uh, clearly teaches against. I'm speaking of the Baal Shem Tov. He used amulets, spells, and other means to control his god and other spirits. Through the Besht and the Kabbalah, belief and practice quickly became prevalent teaching theology that is nowhere to be found in scripture. The, the theology of Ein Sof, nothingness, and the breaking of the vessels makes God out to be the source and continued problem of sin. It also puts man on an equal plane with God. Instead of being created in the image of God, we are created out of God. It's not, and I don't mean that as in we are uh, <laughs> God created man in his image. When the Hasid says God created man in his, his image, he means that he's part of the Ein Sof. That's not how we see it in the Torah. That's not what the, the Bible teaches us. Tikkun Olam says that man was created good, and that God, uh, like from the beginning, was created good, and that God is the source of evil, and that God is unable to do it without us. It puts the salvation of the world into the hands of man and takes it away from the Messiah Yeshua. Reincarnation takes away the need for the Messiah to die for his elect. It minimizes sin to something that does not jeopardize our relationship with the Almighty, but rather teaches that we can do it again if we need to. 
Hasidism teaches a form of transcendental meditation. This theology is a way to control God, lifting a person beyond this world through concentration and trance-like states of prayer in which the person leaves self behind in order to be more connected to God. Today, within Hasidism, amulets, spells, and necromancy are still prevalent. Um, I, I'll just say this. When I was in, uh, I said at the beginning, I was with the Breslavers, and I, I studied with them in, uh, for a very, very short time, and one of them, the guy who was my teacher, took me to the, the Tomb of David. And we walked in, and I, I thought, okay, Tomb of David, that's pretty cool, whatever, not knowing that it probably isn't really the Tomb of David. And he said, uh, he said okay, well, now bow your head and just ask David to protect you and, and you know, guide you through, through uh, the day. And I thought to myself, What? Why would I do that? Why wouldn't I ask God to, you know, like, and I, I of course, just kind of sat there while he sat there and prayed to David. Little did I know that this was a, a, quite a prevalent practice within uh, Hasidism. You know, they go to the tomb of the Baal Shem Tov. They pray to the Baal Shem Tov. They pray to all these different uh, dead people. So it's quite prevalent. Finally, the Zadik is a Persian perversion of the true Messiah Yeshua. It gives divine status to man while at the same time rejecting the true Zadik. They replaced Emmanuel with a mere man. It is my belief that we should not try to emulate or mirror the, Hasid uh, the Hasidic sects in any way, shape, or form. This theology is a counterfeit. It is the dark side that has deceived much of Orthodox and Hasidic Judaisms into in integrating demonic theology into their everyday lives. When people see me, when they hear me, when they watch my life, I don't want them to think I'm in any way associated with such, such theology. Rather, I want them to see the Messiah Yeshua and the Torah shining through my life. Finally, I, you know, I just want to say this. I, I hope that no one uh, thinks that I'm uh, you know, coming down on anybody specific. What I'm trying to say is that you know, when we look at Judaism, we need to be prepared for what they believe and the discussions that we're having. Before I wrote this uh, paper, I would have never thought that when a Hasid comes to me and says, you believe in the Trinity, you're an idolater, I could retort with, yeah, you believe in the Sefirot, so you believe in ten in one. Knowing these kind of things and being able to understand the theology that is so prevalent within Judaism, I think is very important for us as we try to spread the word of the Messiah and the true Zadik, the true Rebbe, the only true Rebbe to those people. Thank you.